One of my first YouTubes featured a woman who looked like Mrs. Doubtfire. It was about the genius tricks food companies use so we can't stay away from processed food. Like Nabisco adding a layer of sugar and cinnamon to graham crackers, adding 50 calories per cracker, and getting us to eat more crackers per sitting. Yikes. Honey made Teddy Grahams. Everyday wholesome snacks for every wholesome family. Honey made. This is wholesome. And I interviewed the author of The Dorito Effect, who explained how chemical flavorings turned a boring corn chip into a sensation we can't stop putting in our faces. <laughs> oh, give me that. So when I saw a paper with the title, Ultra Processed Diets Cause Excess Calorie Intake and Weight Gain, I thought, duh, tell me something I don't know. So little time, so many papers, pass. But then I noticed Kevin Hall was the lead author, and I thought, oh, that changes everything. Kevin is really good. Why would Kevin conduct a study on the obvious? I had read Sugar, Fat, and Salt, and I even talked to the author, Michael Moss, on the phone. Like him, I believe those had to be the drivers, along with artificial flavors and lack of fiber. But Kevin was smart enough to design a study that could actually prove or disprove it with data. To my shock, he seemed to actually disprove it, at least partially. <laughs> they designed meals using processed food that were matched to mostly whole food meals in sugar, fat, salt, and fiber. Wait, what? How did they do that? Then they randomized people to eat the different meals and measured every little thing, which they could do because the volunteers were confined to their facilities for 30 days, so they couldn't cheat. In fact, the paper spoke to why I overeat certain foods and I don't like what the scale says later. Oh my gosh, dried jackfruit is like candy to me. Why can't I stop eating it? If you're one of those people who doesn't eat any processed food, maybe you're keto, Mediterranean, or vegan, and you still struggle with weight, I feel you. Dr. Hall says maybe 75% of BMI is heritable. My grandparents were overweight in the 30s. This is grandpa in the 50s. Dad, mom, and my sisters struggled mightily with their weight. I just can't have certain foods in the house like raw unsalted pistachios or cashews, or I lose my mind and put on the pounds. You know those episodes on YouTube that consumers love but it causes scientists to facepalm? A chiropractor overdoses on butter for 10 days and gets millions of views? Kevin's experiment is like nine levels above that, but it gets approximately zero consumer views because it's buried in a scientific paper that causes their eyes to water. So for this episode on his processed food paper, I'll combine my narration with an interview I did with Dr. Hall. What do you mean 75% of BMI is heritable? We've all seen the photos of Woodstock when everyone was skinny. Our genes didn't change in 50 years. That ought to be a gotcha question for Dr. Hall. And then I'll do an episode on his study comparing people eating low-fat vegan to high-fat keto. That should get some heads exploding in the comments. So can you describe the facility that you do these in? Sure. So, so the NIH Clinical Center, which is the main sort of hospital where we do most of our research, it's the world lar world's largest hospital that's devoted entirely to clinical research. So every patient that's in the hospital is signed up for some sort of research study. We have a metabolic kitchen, which is basically a fancy kitchen that's designed to kind of measure out extraordinarily precisely ingredients for different diets and design those diets to meet certain very rigorous standards. And it's essentially a hospital ward, so it's not the most idyllic place to necessarily spend all of your time. But it's a it's a place where we can completely control somebody's food environment. We can make all sorts of measurements about what happens to people when we adjust the, the foods that we expose them to. Then we also have uh, really fun tools like metabolic chambers. People live in these rooms, relatively small rooms, for sometimes 48 hours at a time. They basically are having measurements of their oxygen consumption on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, their carbon dioxide production. We're measuring, you know, all of their urine to find out how much nitrogen is excreted in their urine. And from that, we can calculate how many calories they're burning on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, how much is coming from carbohydrate oxidation, fat oxidation, that sort of thing. And then, of course, we have core facilities to measure all sorts of uh, things on the blood and the urine that we collect in these folks. And more recently, the the poop that we collect for microbiota and all sorts of other things. So, so yeah, it's a really wonderful place to kind of do these very highly controlled diet intervention studies. But it's in this relatively odd 
odd environment, right? It's a hospital environment. And so so that's always one of the complications of having this high level of control. You kind of have to have uh, some degree of artificiality associated with it. Looking at those photos, it made it real, but it didn't look as processed as I had envisioned from the title. I think you used the word ultra processed, and I was seeing things like canned corn in there. So you got me scrambling to see what the NOVA guidelines were. Not all of the foods that are in the ultra-processed diets are in the ultra-processed category. When we design these diets, and when I say we, I really mean the dietitians and the chefs at the clinical center because I wouldn't have the ability to do the things that they do. They're amazingly talented people. But we're trying to match a whole bunch of different things at once, right? So we're trying to basically match the presented calories. We're trying to define a certain energy density, the number of calories per gram of foods and beverages that we provide to people. We're trying to match the fiber. We're trying to match the carbs and the fat and the salt. And so some of the choices that we make, even within the ultra-processed diet. So for example, I got angry letters from people saying, why is milk in your ultra-processed diet? It's like, well... The milk is not ultra processed, but you know we poured it on the breakfast cereal, which was ultra processed. And so, because that's kind of what most people do with <laughs> with their breakfast cereals, they pour milk on it. So not everything in that diet is ultra processed, and some things would have been added to kind of match for other factors that we wanted in the diet. But the goal was to have eighty percent of the calories that were presented to people belong to this so called ultra processed categorization system for uh, the Nova categorization system. So they rank the foods into four different categories of sort of minimally or unprocessed foods. It's basically whole foods that you would basically wash and cut up and things like that. Culinary ingredients are the category two foods, things you don't eat on their own, sugar or salt or butter or things like that. And then there's the category three foods, which they call processed foods, which are basically combinations of category one and category two foods. And then there's the category four foods, which are these ultra processed foods. And it has this very long definition that I don't fully understand, to be honest with you, but it has to do with the extent and purpose of processing. They typically involve a lot of additives, flavor additives or preservatives, things like that that you wouldn't typically use in home cooking. And our goal for that study was to match the two test diets, one that was minimally processed and had 80% of calories from Category 1 Nova Foods, with the other diet that was 80% of calories from Category 4 ultra-processed foods, but matched for calories, matched for fat, matched for sugar, matched for carbs, uh, matched for sodium, matched for fiber, and overall energy density of the day's meals. Lots of constraints when you then say you're going to match for all these different things and yet have this one variable, huge variable, which was the um, degree and extent and purpose of processing. And just looking at that whole table of foods and all the things you had to match, it's like, wow, how did they do that? Like fiber really got, how did they match fiber? And I see that you did it by adding to the drinks. Yeah, exactly. So the way that maybe an average American would do if they were basically said, oh, I have to increase my fiber intake. Well, what's the mm-hmm. easiest thing to do, right? I'll go get a fiber supplement. And I see. these are, we used a popular fiber supplement that was soluble and that we could dissolve in a basically a low calorie beverage that they could drink, which they didn't necessarily know had the fiber in it, by the mm. way. So <laughs> all they saw was basically a, a, a lemonade that they could drink with their meals. And funnily enough, we were actually able to match the fiber that was actually consumed, although it's very different kinds of fiber, right, than the soluble fiber versus insoluble fiber. So again, that's another thing to kind of keep in mind when interpreting these studies is that just because the top line sort of name matches, in other words, we matched for fiber, the types of fiber were very different between the two diets. Similarly, sugars were matched, but there were zero added sugars in the unprocessed diet and a lot of added sugars in the ultra-processed diet. I love how we serve ice cream with cake. You know what we go with this sugar bread? Some frozen sugar milk. <laughs> Let's give it to the four-year-old, see how they respond. <laughs> oh, they're going crazy. Similarly with the fat, lots more saturated fat in the ultra-processed versus the odd process. So we're in Southern California right now, even though it doesn't look like it, with one of our son's families. And I should explain that the subjects of this experiment could eat as much as they want. And they got a lot of snacks. When on the processed diet, their snacks didn't seem terrible to me, like dry roasted peanuts, baked potato chips, applesauce, although they also provided stuff like goldfish. Whereas on the other diet, they provided things like apples, raisins, and raw nuts. The team also asked them about palatability and familiarity of the foods. And to my surprise, they ranked both meals about the same. Kudos to the cooks. 
When Kevin says the meals were matched for calorie density, he's usually talking about with drinks included. And that's because the processed food meals usually had diet lemonade. I just read Stefan Guillenet's book, The Hungry Brain. He's a neuroscientist specializing in obesity, and the most fascinating takeaway for me is how the body fights for a higher set point when we eat foods that light up the brain's reward center, like brownies. Among the things he said that lights up the reward system is the calorie density of the food. High reward foods tend to increase food intake and adiposity, while lower reward foods tend to have the opposite effect. This suggests a weight management secret you'll rarely find in a diet book. Eat simple food. The reason you'll rarely find it in a diet book is that by definition, lower reward food is not very motivating. It doesn't get us excited about a diet, and it doesn't make books fly off the shelves. We want to hear that we can lose weight while eating the most delicious food of our lives, and the weight loss industry is happy to indulge us. But in that particular study, you didn't match protein. Yeah, it was a little bit different. You're right. And that opened the door. It looked like in the writing of the paper, it was as if you were saying some people are going to use the, the protein leverage <laughs> hypothesis to say, well, okay, then that's the explanation. People were eating more calories in order to achieve their protein requirements. Can you right. comment on that? You're right. That was kind of one of the things that I was surprised about with our data was, number one, yeah, there, there was a very small difference in the amount of protein that we presented to people between the two diets. I didn't think it could possibly make a big deal. But then I sort of went back and saw that, indeed, when you actually looked at the amount of protein that was actually consumed between the two diets, it was strikingly similar. Right, So we presented slightly different amounts and that they ate almost exactly the same amount of protein between the two because diets. Because they ate more calories? And, the, and they ate a lot more calories of the ultra-processed diet, which had a lower percentage of protein, but then they ended up eating the same absolute amount, which is very kind of harkens back to this protein leverage idea, which is basically that you have a certain target absolute level of protein that you're searching for. If you dilute the amount of protein in your overall diet, then you will eat excess carbs and fat to make up for or that target amount of protein. And so that looked strangely like what we saw in that study. And then the question was, how much of the effects could we actually explain based on this protein leverage hypothesis? And so I went back and looked at the old data and you know, how much leverage there really was. I don't even think the originators of the protein leverage hypothesis suggest that the leverage is perfect. But even if it was perfect, you could really only explain about 50% of the calorie differences between the two diets based on the protein leverage hypothesis. I don't think that it's perfect protein leverage either, that most of the data suggests that if there is a protein leverage effect, it may be roughly 50%. In fact, we wrote a paper about that uh, as well. So yeah, so I, I'm not discounting that as a possibility, but I don't think it can possibly explain all of our data. It could certainly contribute. And you commented that they didn't seem to be drawn to the higher protein foods when they're eating the processed diet in order to get their protein requirements? So there was another paper that was kind of very interesting that I think does bear on the protein leverage hypothesis, which is, you know, we're, we're humans. We don't just eat like a mixture of gruel or homogenous diet like a mouse would, which were some of the original data uh, testing the protein leverage hypothesis. We get to choose which foods we eat, right? We can pick off our plate, you know, the higher protein foods or the lower protein foods. And there was a study, I'll have to look up exactly what the link was, that what they did was they put people on a relatively protein deficient diet for a period of time and then let them eat however much they wanted. And if the protein leverage hypothesis was strictly true, then they should have eaten many, many more calories after being on the protein deficient diet as compared to the, the ample protein diet. And that's not what happened. What happened was that people ended up just choosing more high protein foods after being protein deprived for a period of time and they didn't eat any more calories. They just chose higher protein foods to make up for that difference, which, you know, sort of makes sense, right? Why would you just overeat everything? They just selected higher protein foods if they'd been in a deficit for a period of time. And that's that's something that our meals would have allowed people to do. So did the results surprise you of this experiment? Yeah, they did. Because when I was first introduced to this idea of ultra processed food, I read the definition for the NOVA 4 categorization and the implication being that focusing on nutrients isn't all that important. You should really just be focusing on the extent and purpose of processing of food. That struck me as a very bold sort of statement that nutrition scientists have been making some pretty good progress for centuries now, focusing on the nutrients and what foods are made out of and focusing less on, if anything, on 
processing of foods. And so this group in Brazil came along and they said, no, 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 you've been focusing on the wrong thing for too long. You should really be focusing on the extent and purpose of processing. You know, that struck me as a very strange way to think about nutrition. Carlos Montero is a professor of nutrition and public health at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Ultra-processed foods are not modified foods. They are a formulation of industrial ingredients, a very low-cost ingredients. These components could be protein isolates, could be sugar, particularly cosmetic additives to make them very tasty, very colorful. Our bodies are simply not prepared to be fed with these formulations. The formulation of these products actually aim to fool our bodies and making our bodies consume more than we need doses and doses of new additives every year. In some cases, like emulsifiers, for instance, that are very common in ultra-processed foods, we know that these emulsifiers, they can affect the permeability of our intestinal cells. Again, we lose ability to control what goes in our bodies because these emulsifiers destroy some protection we have against the absorption of some molecules. When I was first introduced to that idea, the people who who told me about it thought that it's really ultra-processed foods that are driving obesity. And I said, well, what is it about ultra-processed foods that are driving obesity? And these folks said, well, they're really high in salt, sugar, and fat, and low in fiber. And my reaction was, well, you just named a bunch of nutrients. So is it the nutrients or is it something else about ultra-processed foods? And so that's why we designed the study to match for those nutrients of concern. And so my thought was, if we did that, if we matched those nutrients between the two diets, that I wouldn't see much effect between people choosing to eat more or less calories on one diet or another. I thought that we could basically say, you know, it probably is more about the nutrients than the extent and purpose of processing. And so I was wrong. I was, I was very wrong. They consume, the same people consume 500 calories per day more on the ultra-processed diet as compared to the unprocessed diet. And they gained weight on the ultra-processed diet, even though they couldn't see their weight gain. They were blinded to their weight measurements, and then they spontaneously lost weight during the unprocessed diet. So yeah, it was really intriguing. And now the question is, okay, so it seems to be something more than just the overall amount of salt, sugar, fat, and fiber, at least at that sort of top level description of those nutrients. What is it that caused people to consume excess calories on the ultra processed food? And so we have probably more hypotheses than we can possibly test at this point, but we sort of chose the top couple that we think are most likely. And we have a, a new study going on now, right as we speak, actually, um, at the clinical center where we have people staying again with us for a month at a time. And we've basically want to replicate the original results. So we have basically two diets very similar to those the first two, and then we've reformulated two new ultra-processed diets that are now um, both still 80% of calories from ultra-processed foods, but one of them is matched more for the energy density of the non-beverage items in the uh, in the unprocessed diet, and the other one is... Uh, for the last ultra-processed diet they tested, Kevin needed to explain some background. So I should back up a second. One of the hypotheses that somebody had, a woman uh, professor in Canada, Kansas named Tara Fazino. She came out with a new way of objectively categorizing foods based on what she calls hyperpalatability. Although she actually isn't asking people how palatable the foods are, she's basically saying whether or not an individual food crosses a pair of thresholds for sugar and fat, salt and fat, or salt and carbs. There was no scientific definition of what are these foods, what about them yields such strong reinforcing properties for clinically significant problems such as obesity, binge eating disorder, that type of thing. Food companies do have really explicit formulas for how they create these types of foods. So in my work, I sought out to actually use a data-driven approach to develop a quantitative definition of these foods that was based on combinations of nutrients. If an individual food crosses a pair of those thresholds, it's deemed hyperpalatable. And there aren't very many foods that exist in nature that are, you know, cross those pairs of thresholds. 
she asked us to take a look at our data and say, did you present people with more individual food items that cross these pairs of thresholds? And I thought at first, well, we matched for all those nutrients, the fat, the salt, and the carbs, and the sugar. So I can't imagine that that would be true, but we were, those were only matched over the co- average over the course of the day. We could still have more of those individual foods crossing those pairs of thresholds, and indeed we did. So he presented people with more individual foods that were deemed hyperpalatable by this definition. Definition. And then we just published a paper in Nature Food, and it. we're trying to assess, well, how much of the effect that we observed on consumption of a given meal could be explained by these so-called hyperpalatable foods, the percentage of calories that were presented that cross both of these thresholds. And it was a surprisingly large amount. is about 40% of the effects could be mediated by that factor. Energy density was another factor of the non-beverage items that we think are important. So the idea of the new study is to create two new ultra-processed diets that now vary both in energy density of the non-beverage items, as well as the number of items that are deemed hyperpalatable, number of individual food items, and try to tease apart how much of the effect of ultra-processed foods are due to these two factors, non-beverage energy density and the percentage of calories presented as hyperpalatable foods. We use data from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Food and Nutrient Database for Dietary Studies. So we applied our definition to this database to characterize the initial prevalence in the food system. Hyperpalatable foods comprise the majority of the foods in the food system. And interestingly, the most common type of hyperpalatable foods was actually those that had elevated fat and sodium. And so this meant a lot of our like meal-based items, snack-based items, those were really the ones that were characterizing and, and capturing the majority of what was in our food system, not really the things that at least descriptively in the literature have often been the focus, which is like dessert type stuff, things that are high in fat and sugar. But this kind of indicated to me that like, no, actually the problem is like in our meals. I interviewed an author last year who wrote the book, The Dorito Effect. Yep. One of his statements stopped me in my tracks when he said, think about a sugary carbonated beverage. If it isn't flavored, you won't drink it. It it would be terrible. Uh But as soon as they add chemical flavorings, you know, the the kind that have been developed over the last 40 years, especially, all of a sudden it's cream soda. And then you just say, whoo The interesting thing is that with the the hyperpalatable foods definition that Tara came up with, it wouldn't count the artificial sweeteners, right? So it's really just sugar and fat. It's kind of an interesting question whether or not it should be expanded to include artificial sweeteners sweeteners and fat. I finally asked my gotcha question. If BMI is 75% heritable, how come people were so skinny in the 60s? Yeah, this is something that I think a lot of people have a lot of confusion about, right? So within any given environment, body size is highly heritable. In 1962, the first Taco Bell opened, Pop-Tarts were introduced to the public and Doritos were invented. If you change the environment, it doesn't mean that there's not going to be any shift in that distribution, population distribution. So back in the 1960s, where we're clearly in a different food environment, a different physical activity environment, a different work environment, a different leisure environment, the people who are at the upper end of the BMI spectrum would also be at the upper end of the BMI spectrum now. It's just that now they're at a much higher BMI. If you could do this experiment, yeah, if you had identical twins, one was frozen and then thawed out and in uh, in in uh, and was at the same age in the year 2023 as they were in 1963 they would both be at roughly the same rank order in the population BMI distribution it's just that the one now would be at a much much higher BMI than the one in the 1960s well in the year 2000 um, I think I'll probably be the spaceship to the moon dictating robots robots. Some of our work has also focused on characterizing the change in hyperpalatable food availability. First of all, there was a 20% increase in the availability of hyperpalatable foods from 1988 to 2018. The evidence really pointed to reformulation as opposed to just increasing in the variety of foods available. I thought this was really important because what we were able to do was actually look at the same food from 88 to 2018. And we found that compared to 1988, foods in 2001 were over two 
times more likely to be hyper palatable compared to the same food item in, in 88. The same foods in 2018 were four over four times more likely to be hyper palatable compared to the same food items in 88. So what's my takeaway from this episode? It's that Kevin's impressive study revealed a simple truth you can verify with your own eyes. Just walk through most European airports and take note of what food is for sale and what people are actually eating. I did this a few months ago for Copenhagen and Stockholm, then do the same in American airports. I did this a few months ago in the Dallas airport. Europeans have roughly half the diabetes rate and half the obesity rates of Americans. And as ultra-processed food gains traction in Europe, their obesity rates go up too. We're just way ahead of them. It's simple. I know I didn't answer a legit question in this episode that many people have, which is, could it just be the added sugar in the processed food? There are many doctors like Richard Johnson, who wrote the book Nature Wants Us to Be Fat, who think that's the simple answer. There is a biologic switch. Obesity is driven by a switch. That switch is fructose. An individual fruit is not going to do it. It's got fiber, it's got vitamin C, it's got potassium, it's got a lot of things that block the effects of fructose. To fully understand that idea, I read Robert Lustig's book, Metabolical, because he's famous for saying it's all about the sugar in processed food. I was encouraged by something he said in the intro because it gave me the impression that the book is focused on processed food. This meat versus no meat controversy has caused the public to take their eyes off the ball, much to the food industry's delight. One of the goals of this book is to help bury the hatchet in this fake diet war by showing that real vegan and real keto can both work. But it seemed to me he really brought out the hatchet for plant-based diets in several chapters of the book. Furthermore, the low-fat diet, a bastardized version of the plant-based diet, has been a dismal failure, killing more people than cigarettes. And that feels like a great segue to the next episode about Kevin's clinical study comparing a low-fat plant-based diet to an animal-based keto diet, neither of which had added sugar. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much. I wore a special sweatshirt for you <laughs> that's good i love it <laughs> great